the London Baptist Confession, the Second London Baptist Confession, which uh, is our church's confession, that which we identify with in terms of the doctrine that we believe the Bible teaches. We are going through the confession, not because we think it's equally important to the scriptures at all, but because we think it's a good reflection, a good expression of the Bible's teaching. And so anything that we study tonight on this document, by the way, if you don't have this document, make sure you grab one. Uh, Anything that we study tonight on this document, which is chapter 7 of the London Baptist Confession, only has authority in as much as it rightly teaches what's found in this book, which is the Bible. Um, And we believe it rightly reflects what the Bible teaches, and that's why we are going through the confession, uh, because it helps us to be rooted and grounded in the foundational and most important doctrines of the Bible in a very clear and systematic way. And so tonight we have made it so far to chapter 7. We have your sheet in front of you there. You'll notice that it's on God's covenant. Chapter 7 of God's covenant. How many of you are familiar with the term covenant theology? Imagine most, many in the room are. Covenant theology. So covenant theology is I think one of the most important doctrines when it comes to our ability to understand the Bible. So if if we have a good covenant theology, a biblical covenant theology, then we will be able to understand the Bible in ways that we could never understand it without it. Covenant theology basically refers to how we understand the Bible to unfold. How do we understand how Genesis chapter 1 is connected with everything that follows it all the way to the end of the book of Revelation. For us, our understanding is that we understand it through this idea of covenant. God enters into covenant with his people. He does that in a number of different covenants, as we'll see tonight. But the particular emphasis of this chapter and the particular emphasis of the scriptures is God's covenant of grace. The covenant of grace that God makes with his people. And so God enters into a contract with us. That's what a covenant is. When when you get married, you're making a covenant with your wife. She is agreeing to marry you. You are agreeing to marry her, vice versa. Your husband is agreeing to marry you. It's a covenant. It's an agreement between two parties. You're agreeing to fulfill certain obligations with certain understanding. And when God enters into covenant with us, it's not exactly the same thing because he's not asking us for our say in the matter. He's not saying, hey, is it okay if we work out this agreement between me and you and we enter into this covenant? No, God is defining the terms, but he is bringing us into a contractual agreement with himself in which God is promising certain things based on certain conditions. So that's what a covenant is. It's a binding agreement that God makes with us where God says, I will do this for you. Here are the circumstances. Here are the conditions. I will accomplish this for you. And here are your obligations in the covenant, in this agreement. That's what a covenant is. And we'll consider some of the different covenants that God makes with his people as we go through these chapters. With particular emphasis, as I've mentioned, on the covenant of grace. So I will go through this paragraph by paragraph. I'll go ahead and say that the majority of our time will be spent on the third paragraph So if you get hopeful after the first two paragraphs that we're almost done, don't get discouraged when it goes on another 20 minutes after that. Most of the time will be spent on the revelation of the covenant of grace, which is the third paragraph. But we'll start with the first paragraph. Why does God make a covenant? Why does God even enter into a covenant with anybody? I'll read the confession, and then we'll go to the scripture passages that teach that. It says in that first paragraph, the distance between God and the creature is so great that although reasonable creatures owe obedience to him as their creator, they could never have attained the reward of life except by some voluntary condescension or stooping down on the part of God. He has been pleased to express this condescension by way of covenant. So again, we're asking the question, why does God make a covenant with us? Not just the covenant of grace, but any covenant at all. Why would God ever make any sort of covenant with any person? And the answer is not that we deserve it in any way. Not that he's obligated to in any way. 
the, the reality is there's such a distinction, this is point A there on the outline, there's such a distinction between the creator and the creature that no matter what we do in our act of obedience, God is never under any sort of obligation to reward us for it. We never make God our debtor. We never obey to such a degree that then God is obligated to reward us for that obedience. If you have your Bibles, you can open with me to to Luke 17. Luke chapter 17, where Jesus is teaching on this idea of the creature, uh, the the creator-creature distinction. Luke 17, verse 10, I believe. Let me, well, beginning in verse 7. Which of you, having a slave plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in, front of, come in from the field, come immediately and sit down to eat? But will he not say to him, prepare something for me to eat and properly clothe yourself and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you may eat and drink? He does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded you, say, We are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we have ought to have done, or which we ought to have done. Jesus there is not giving a lesson on slavery or on being a master. He's not teaching some sort of moral lesson on those issues. He's simply making a point based on common modern day experience at his time that a master is never under obligation to reward the slave for simply doing what he was required to do. And in the same way, God is our master. He is our creator. We are his creatures. We are his slaves. In the sense that we owe him complete and utter obedience, unwaveringly. And God is never under any obligation to say, because you did this, I must now reward you with eternal life. That's even the case in the original uh, command that he gave to Adam. Uh, Well, We'll see that momentarily. But even that command given to Adam, obey and you will live, even that was an act of kindness on God's part. He was under no obligation to promise Adam life based on his obedience. And yet, God is a condescending God. So God is under no obligation to reward us with anything, and yet, at the same time, God is condescending. He is humble in the way that he stoops down to our level, in order to enter into relationship with us. God doesn't have to do that, but he does. Again, if you have your your Bibles open to Psalm 113, Psalm 113, verses 4 to 7, this emphasizes the transcendence of God. He is extremely exalted, infinitely exalted above creation. He is in no way dependent upon his creatures. He owes nothing to his creatures. He is eternally above and independent from his creatures. Psalm 113, verse 4, The Lord is high above all nations. His glory is above the, ne- above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is enthroned on high, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. And the psalm goes on further to expand on that. But the idea is God is infinitely exalted. He owes the creature nothing. And yet he stoops all the way down to our level to enter into a covenant with us. Any covenant, any agreement that God makes with creatures is an act of grace on his part. He's under no obligation to do so. But he does. And so a foundational understanding of covenant theology that begins with that Covenant theology begins with the understanding that God didn't have to make the covenant at all. Any covenant that he's ever made, he doesn't have to make it. But he does because he is a gracious God. And even though he is eternally exalted above us, he loves us as his creatures, as his image bearers. And in his love, he condescends, he humbles himself to make a covenant with us. From there, uh, now into paragraph two, we start to look at the specific covenants that God has made with us. As his, as his image bearers, as, as human beings. This paragraph now dealing with the nature of the covenant of grace. So it says, Moreover, man, having brought himself under the curse of the law by his fall, 
It pleased the Lord to make a covenant of grace. In this, he freely offers to sinners life and salvation by Jesus Christ, requiring from them faith in him in order that they may be saved and promising to give his Holy Spirit to all those who are ordained to eternal life to make them willing and able to believe. So again, notice the the subheadings there, the first letter, the need for the covenant, letter A, the need for the covenant. Why did God have to make a covenant of grace with us? Or why did he... Why did it become necessary for him to do so? Well, because of Adam's fall. If God was going to save us, after Adam's fall, there needed to be a a covenant of grace made. So we looked at this last week. If you were here, then you remember that last week we looked at the fall and the punishment that followed. And we saw last week that in Adam, we all fell. Adam was the original representative of all humanity. Meaning that what happened to Adam happened to all of us. We saw that in Romans, 12, uh, Romans 5 last week, beginning in verse 12. When we looked at Romans 5, we won't go there tonight. But the idea was simply, in Adam, all of us sinned. Even though we didn't sin in the same way he did, when he sinned, we all sinned. We were all counted sinners in him. His guilt was passed on to us. His corruption was passed on to us. His condemnation was passed on to us. We inherited, because of our union with Adam, everything that Adam suffered as a result of his sin. He was our representative, or our head. And as those who are now naturally represented in Adam, we are completely incapable of saving ourselves. There is nothing that you and I could ever do naturally in order to gain eternal life from God. We, in Adam, we have failed the conditions of the covenant. God said, obey to Adam and you will live and all of your descendants with you, as we understand from the rest of scripture. Obey and you will live. Disobey and you will die. That was the covenant. Adam broke it. Humanity was cast into sin as a result of it. We were utterly incapable at that point of doing anything to save ourselves. And God would have been completely righteous to then hand every single one of us over to to death and to hell because of our sin. God would have remained perfectly holy. We could not have looked at God and said, you are unfair for sending us to hell after Adam sinned. That's what we deserve as Adam's offspring because he was our representative head. He represented us. But God didn't do that. God made another covenant He made a covenant of grace with us. The first one was a covenant of works with Adam. That covenant was broken through Adam's sin. And God made another covenant, a covenant of grace. And that's seen there, the first aspect of it in letter B. The head of the covenant, the representative in this covenant, is Jesus. So the head of the other covenant, the first covenant God made with humanity was Adam. The covenant head in this covenant of grace is Jesus. Adam represents all of fallen humanity. Jesus now represents all of redeemed humanity. What happened to Adam happened to us. For those who are in Christ, what Christ has gained by his obedience is now credited to us. And so Christ is the new mediator of this covenant. Adam, the the representative, the mediator of the first covenant of works. Jesus is now the mediator of the covenant of grace. And just as we suffered the consequences of Adam's sin because he represented us, now we enjoy and experience the benefits of Christ's righteousness, his salvation, because we're represented by Jesus. So all of that by way of recap, essentially, from last week. If you were here, hopefully that sounds somewhat familiar. Then letter C moves on to the conditions of the covenant. So we have Jesus as our mediator in this this covenant of grace. But what are the conditions What do we need to do under this new covenant to have life? Under the covenant of works, Adam had to obey. Under this covenant of grace, what do we now need to do to have the eternal benefits that Christ has secured for us? Well, what's the most well-known verse in all the Bible? John 3.16. Right? What do we need to do to inherit eternal life? Believe. For God so loves the world, loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall have eternal life. Whoever believes in the son of God. That's the condition 
of this covenant of grace. How do we have life? Whoever believes will not perish, but whoever believes in the Son will have life. That's the condition. No longer works, but faith. But that's not to say that we are not saved by works. You are saved by works if you're in Christ. And has often been said, it's often been said, you are saved by works. There's, if anyone tries to tell you you are not saved by works, they have a misunderstanding of the gospel. You are saved by works, but they are not your works. You are saved by works, but you are saved by the works of Christ. He has met all of the conditions of the covenant of works... So that now in the covenant of grace, we are saved through faith and not by works. The condition is belief. And then there's also a provision, letter D, in this covenant of grace. The Holy Spirit gives faith. So God requires faith. That's the condition in order to have life in this covenant of grace. But he also gives faith. He gives the thing that's required. We see that in Ephesians 2, verse 8. I'll just read it. You don't need to go there. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that, that is referring back to faith, that faith is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. You're saved by God's grace through faith. And even the faith by which you're saved is God's gift to you. Naturally, again, under Adam, we can't even muster up faith. We don't want to believe. And in Adam, we are incapable of believing because we are dead in our sins. We love our sin. We don't want to believe the things of God and the gospel. We see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and verse 14. A natural man does not accept. By natural man, he's talking about someone who is not born of the Spirit. Someone who is not regenerated. Someone who has not been given faith by the Spirit. He says, to a natural man... Or a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. In the same way Jesus said, you can't see the kingdom of heaven unless you're born again. Paul here in 1 Corinthians 2 is saying, the person who has not been given faith by Jesus, the hardness of their heart causes them to think the things of God are foolishness. But God promises in the covenant of grace not just to require faith of you, But by his mercy, he also gives you the faith that he requires. And so then God does not leave us in the consequences of our sin in Adam, but he made another covenant with us, this covenant of grace, in which he promises life in Christ as our mediator through faith. All right, we've made it through the first two paragraphs. Now we have the bulk of uh, the remaining teaching. Uh, Hopefully... It won't take too long. There's, there's so much here. I was, Sean is my witness that today in the office, I was back and forth about what to say and what not to say. When you get to the revelation of the covenant of grace, which is paragraph three, I mean, really what we're saying is everything in this Bible. Like, what is the revelation of the covenant of grace? It's everything. Everything from Genesis to Revelation is the revelation of the covenant of grace. And so I'm kind of struggling to know what do you say when it comes to trying to explain how God has revealed the covenant of grace. Because we'd have to go through Genesis and then the other 65 books of the Bible in order to do that. Every page of the Bible is revealing, after, after, after Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, every page in the Bible is revealing God's covenant of grace until it finally culminates in the new covenant of Christ where we have the full revelation of the covenant of grace. So let me read the third paragraph, and then we'll work through it as best we can. My goal is to say what's in the paragraph, uh, but, but mainly my goal is to provide some form of framework to even begin wrapping our minds around the covenant of grace as it's revealed in the scriptures. Some sort of framework in which to, to operate. Uh, n- not nearly uh, every detail will be, will be given. There's no way to do that. But potentially the scaffolding necessary to, to start to put together the pieces. Uh, that's, that's my goal. So the third paragraph, this covenant is revealed in the gospel, first of all to Adam in the promise of salvation by the seed of the woman, 
and afterwards by further steps until its full revelation was completed in the New Testament. This covenant is founded upon the eternal covenant transaction between the Father and the Son concerning the redemption of the elect. It is only by the grace of this covenant, that's the covenant of grace, that all the posterity or descendants of fallen Adam who ever were saved obtained life and a blessed immortality because man is now utterly incapable of gaining acceptance with God on those terms by which Adam stood in his state of innocence. All right, so let's jump down to the, the four subheadings there. We'll start with letter A. When we think about the revelation of the covenant of grace, and actually, I think a better, better heading for that would be the history of the covenant. Um, so when we're thinking, that paragraph three, I've, I've given the title there, the revelation of the covenant of grace. I think a, maybe a better heading would have been, uh, had I thought of it, the history of the covenant. The history of the covenant. Because we're seeing throughout history, how God is bringing about this covenant of grace. And he does so first by revealing it in progressive steps. That's letter A. God reveals the covenant of grace in progressive steps. God chose not to reveal everything there was to know about the covenant all at one time. Instead, he revealed the covenant in stages or in steps progressively, all of those steps building on themselves until it reaches its final revelation in the person and work of Christ. The whole Bible, as we know, the whole Bible is about Jesus. The whole Bible is about the salvation that Jesus would accomplish for us and the benefits that we would experience through him. Jesus makes this plain, if you want to turn, to me, uh, turn with me to Luke 24. Jesus makes this plain that the whole Bible is about him. He says in Luke 24, verses 25 to 26, by the way, while well, a couple of people are turning there, we'll see in this, uh, these verses the phrase beginning with Moses. There is a very good book, if you're ever interested in reading more about this, called Beginning with Moses by Michael Barrett. Um, he's coming from a slightly different perspective on some things, but overall, very, very helpful in seeing uh, the outworking of covenant theology. Beginning with Moses by Michael Barrett. It's a great book. So Luke 24 Verses 25 to 26, Jesus is showing us that all of the Bible has to do with him. We read, some of those who were, with, uh, that's the wrong verse, 24, 25, okay, 25. And he said to them, O oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them, to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Beginning with Moses, what book did Moses write? Well, what books did Moses write? He wrote the first book, so the very first book of the Bible when Kayla knew it. So when we start with beginning with Moses, we're starting with Genesis chapter 1. When Jesus says, Moses spoke about me, he's saying... From the very beginning of the Bible, it's always been about me. And when he says the prophets, he means everything we find in the scriptures. Everything that is there reveals Christ to us. And he says all this, in case you're thinking, no, he just means the major and minor prophets. No, he says all the scriptures, every single page he's saying talks about me. It's about what I would do. It's about my person, the salvation that I would accomplish Jesus is teaching us that the whole Bible is about him. The apostles make this same point in Romans 1, verses 1 to 3. Paul shows that the promises of old have always been about Jesus. Uh, so Romans chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and then just into 3. He says, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. So he's talking about the gospel of God. What is the gospel of God? which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son. The gospel which Paul was proclaiming was not a new gospel. It was the gospel promised from centuries past through the prophets concerning the son of God, Jesus Christ. We can go to 1 Peter, I won't for the sake of time. 1 Peter says the same thing. The prophets understood Jesus was the Savior. They didn't know who or when he would come, but they were looking forward to when he came. 
All of the Bible is telling us about the covenant of God's grace through Christ. Every single page of it. Not in the same ways. There's different genres. There are different ways that the Bible points us to Christ. But every page is doing that. It is telling us something about the Redeemer that would establish the covenant of God's grace. But the whole Bible is not equally clear or full in its revelation about Jesus. The whole Bible is about Jesus, about the salvation that God would accomplish through him, but it reveals that salvation little by little as you go through the Bible. And so as we read chronologically then through the scriptures, we find that the Bible is providing with every page a little bit more information, a little bit more information, a little bit more information about Christ and about the covenant of grace. And it does that all the way up until the arrival of Christ and then the New Testament where we have the final and full revelation of Jesus on the pages of the scriptures. I'm going to read a quote from that book that I referenced beginning with Moses uh, by Michael Barrett. Uh, I think it's very helpful in providing a picture of how the Bible progressively reveals the covenant of grace. So Michael Barrett, ta- he says, some years ago when my children were young, one of my sons, having gone to the supermarket with my wife, came home with a plastic egg that he purchased from one of the machines designed to seduce children into spending their quarters. I tried to give him a lesson in being frugal and resisting temptation, but he assured me that what was in the plastic egg was worth the price. Inside was a little fish of some magical substance that would increase in size when left in water. So we tried it. We put the little fish in a pan of water, and sure enough, it grew overnight. When we examined the the enlarged fish, we were able to see details that were invisible on the little fish. We saw a mouth, eyes, and even what appeared to be scales. The point is that all those details were on the little fish, but we just could not see them until the enlargement occurred. What a classic example of progressive revelation. The expansion of the little fish revealed details about the fish. Details that were there all the time but we couldn't see them. Similarly, in progressive revelation, God is not altering the essence of the truth. In other words, he's not creating a new covenant that's different from the original one promised. It's not altogether new truth. It's it's all part of the same revelation. He is not altering the essence of the truth. He is enlarging our view and thereby revealing more and more details. I think that's a helpful picture. In Genesis, we have the seed form of the covenant of grace. But by the time we get to Revelation, we have the full-grown tree. And we see it in full bloom. Everything that we need to know about God's covenant of salvation with us through Christ. But there's also another important point to make, and that's in letter B. Though the, the covenant is revealed all throughout Scripture, it was not established until the coming of Christ. I am wrestling now with whether to get into the difference between Presbyterians and Baptists. I told Sean I probably wouldn't for the sake of time. I think I should stick to that. But just for the, for the sake of clarity, we are in 99% agreement with our Presbyterian brethren. This is the one point, primarily when it comes to theolog- uh, covenant theology, in which we differ. The covenant of grace was not established until the new covenant. It was promised, it was revealed, but it was not established until the coming of Christ. Where do I stop? The, emphasis, the, the point being that continuity in the Presbyterian church would lead them to think that the new covenant is not altogether all that much different from the old. And that's why they think circumcision of infants in the Old Testament carries over into baptism of infants in the New Testament. Whereas Baptists, we believe, no, the new covenant is new. The old covenant promised the new covenant, but it wasn't the establishment of the new covenant. The new covenant is new, and it's for believers. The old covenant was for the physical line of Abraham. The new covenant is for those who believe. And so only those who believe receive the sign of the covenant, which is baptism. That's it. It's not established until the coming of Christ, which means then that as we come to try to read the Bible, in some senses, we have to read it backwards. I'll say that again. In some some senses, we have to read the Bible backwards. 
We have to start. We're new covenant Christians, which means we have new covenant revelation. And the new covenant revelation is the fulfillment, the culmination of all preceding promises and revelation. And so if we're going back to the Old Testament to try to understand what did this mean in the book of Genesis or what did this mean in the book of Joshua or what did this mean in the prophets, then we are depriving ourselves of the, the clear teaching that we have on what those things meant. The new covenant tells us what those things meant. And so we have to read the Bible backwards. We start with what is revealed in Christ, in his salvation. And then we go back and we start to understand the progressive revelation of the covenant of grace. And as we do that, then we can start to make sense, uh, more sense, I should say. We could make sense even apart from the ultimate revelation because God was clear throughout history, but he wasn't as uh, fully, he didn't as fully reveal things in the Old Testament as he does in the New. But now that we have the New Covenant, we can go back and we can start to understand more fully the revelation of the Old. And so we see then that the covenant of grace is promised from Genesis 3 on. Genesis 3, verse 15, God, right after the fall, right after Adam sins, God promises a savior from the seed of the woman. This seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head, even though the serpent would bruise his heel, meaning that he would conquer Satan. He would conquer sin, the seed of the woman. And so from Genesis 3, there is a promise of grace. There's a promise that God would send a savior for his people. And then with each new promise and each new covenant throughout the Old Testament, we see that promise worked out more fully. So in the Old Testament, there are other covenants. What are, can anyone name, what's another covenant in the Old Testament? What'd you say? I'll let her with you. Huh? Well, I can't hear you, Dave. What'd you say? The sh show? Shoe covenant? Okay, I don't know. I'm not familiar with that. Shoe covenant? Is there another one anyone can think of? Huh? Yeah, the Noahic covenant, the covenant with Noah. What are some others? Any others? The covenant with Abraham? The covenant with Moses? That's a huge one. Someone say David? Yeah, covenant with David. Then there's the promise of the new covenant, right, and the prophets especially. And so throughout the Old Testament, you have God giving these different covenants. And again, those covenants are Noah, first of all, in Genesis 8 and 9, after the flood. God promises that he will never again destroy the world the way he had in the flood. Now, what's the purpose of that promise? Well, remember, God in Genesis 3 had promised that he would send a Savior. If God destroys the world, can he send a Savior? If God destroys the world before that Savior comes, can there be salvation? No. And so the Noahic covenant, God is promising to preserve creation until the time of the Messiah to make sure that salvation can actually come. And then there's the Abrahamic covenant, the covenant with Abraham. And that covenant promises that through Abraham's seed, God's people would inherit a land and a blessing. But it also tells us that that land and that blessing is not just for God's people. Abraham's seed would bring a blessing to who? To the whole world, to all the nations. And so you see this progressive buildup. We've got the seed promised to, to Adam and Eve in the garden. Now we find out, well, then we find out that God's not going to destroy the world until that seed comes. And now we find out that that seed is going to be the seed of Abraham. So not just the seed of the woman, now we know it's going to be through the line of Abraham. And we now know that this seed is going to give a blessing, land, and, and, uh, and, a, and a great nation to, to Abraham. There's going to be a great nation. That nation is going to be blessed. And all the nations are going to be blessed through that seed. And so things start to get clearer and clearer as we go through these different covenants. And then we come to the covenant made with Moses. And we'll talk maybe in more detail about that in just a few minutes. But in the covenant of Moses, God shows his people who are now in covenant with them how they should live. More particularly, he establishes the ceremonial and sacrificial law. And when we get to Hebrews, we find out that all of that is pointing to Jesus. All of the ceremonies, all of the sacrifices, those things are telling us something about Jesus. And then we get to the covenant of David. What was promised to David in the covenant of 2 Samuel 7? Anyone know? 
A son? What would that son do? He would reign as king. And how long would he reign as king? Forever. Okay, so now we've got another element of revelation. Not only is it going to be the seed of the woman, which is the seed of Abraham, who's going to bless all the nations, but the blessing to all the nations is going to come through David's son, who would also be a king seated upon his throne. And his throne would be one that endures forever. And so the revelation is building. Our understanding of this covenant of grace is starting to build on itself. And then we come to the promise of the new covenant. And we see that in a number of the prophets. And what's promised in the new covenant? A new heart is promised. God is going to give his people a new heart. He's going to make us love his law and believe him. God is going to cleanse us and purify us of all of our sin. He's going to sprinkle us clean through the blood of Jesus. And so we find then that this covenant made with Abraham is also a covenant of eternal forgiveness. God is promising not just to give us a blessing, but to give us forgiveness through this promised Messiah, this promised Savior. And then by the time we actually get to the new covenant, as we open the pages of Matthew, by the way, what, what are the, anyone know the first uh, few words of the book of Matthew? Anybody? Starting with the account of Jesus, it says, the record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. What is Matthew doing there? He's showing this is nothing new. This Savior who has come is simply the promise of the Old Testament. He's here. The new covenant has come. And, and so then as we look at the new covenant and we realize Jesus is the fulfillment of everything that's ever been promised, we go back and we start to see Jesus is the seed of the woman. And Jesus is the son of Abraham. And he's the priest and the sacrifice of the Mosaic law. And he's the son of David who will reign on his throne forever. And he ushers in this new covenant of new hearts and eternal forgiveness. And so we find the covenant of grace finds its ultimate revelation in the arrival of Christ in the new covenant. In addition to the covenants, we could go through the Old Testament as well and see that there are hundreds of types and shadows of Christ. And so the covenants progressively reveal something about the covenant of grace, but so do so many other things in the Old Testament that happen within the framework of those covenants. And so we could go to the ark and we could see from 2 Peter 3 that in some ways the ark represents God through Christ delivering us from the, from the flood of his wrath. The ark is God's deliverance in Christ from the flood of God's wrath. Or we could go to a number of passages in the New Testament as well, John 15, and see that Jesus is the true Israel. He's the true vine. And so when we read about Israel as the vine in the Old Testament, we're seeing this is Christ. He's the one who fulfills these things. And then when we come to the account of the manna in the wilderness, we start to understand Jesus is the heavenly manna. He's the bread of life. The manna is supposed to lead us to an understanding that when we feast on Christ, we have life. Or the rock in the wilderness that brought forth water, we start to see Christ is the rock in the wilderness. He's the one who gives us eternal living water. And the list could go on and on to the bronze serpent and the scapegoat. We go to the story of Joseph and we see all kinds of types of Christ in the account of Joseph. We could go to Jonah, three days in the belly of the whale. Christ, three days in the belly of the earth, raised from the dead to deliver God's people. We could go to Samson. How did Samson defeat God's enemies? in the end of his life, by death, right? Through his death, he conquered God's enemies. And we go to Christ. Through Christ's death, he conquered his enemies. As we have now the revelation of the new covenant, we can go back to the old, and we can start to see Christ in so many places. We don't want to look for him where he's not, but where we have valid reason to see Christ, we should. He's everywhere in the Old Testament in different ways, but he's everywhere. So the point is simply this, the covenant of grace reaches its full revelation in the new covenant. And so as we look back then at, at everything that precedes the new covenant, we start to see that the goal of every detail, every covenant, every promise, the goal of it all was to tell us something about the new covenant, which is the establishment of the covenant of grace through Christ. Letter C, 
sort of almost finished. Letter C, it's founded on the eternal covenant. Um, I, I won't go into detail on this. I'll simply reference 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, we read, Who has saved us? God has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works. And now listen, this is, this is the reason this verse is here. But according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ from all eternity. Grace was granted us in Christ from all eternity. In eternity, God had already determined the covenant of grace. So when Adam sinned, God was not caught off guard and he didn't spontaneously come up with some plan of salvation. He'd already planned and purposed the plan of salvation and the covenant of grace. So what happens in history is simply the expression of what God had already purposed within the Trinity in eternity. God the Father had already determined to send his Son to save sinners. And God the Son had already determined to be sent by the Father to give his life a ransom for many. And God the Spirit had already determined in eternity to apply the benefits of that salvation to the souls of God's redeemed. There was a covenant among the persons of the Trinity that is eternal and that is the foundation of what's then expressed in history in the covenant of grace. Letter D, this covenant of grace is the only grounds of salvation ever. This covenant of grace is the only grounds of salvation ever. No matter what part of the Bible you're reading, salvation has always been granted through the grounds of grace in the covenant of grace. It's, it's only been granted on the basis of the grace of Christ, which is established in the new covenant. And so the covenant of grace was not actually established until the new covenant, but the grace of the new covenant was applied to saints throughout all of history on the basis of faith. It's not as though Noah was saved by means of some act of his, and then Abraham was saved by some other means, and then Moses was saved by some other means, and then in the new covenant we're saved by faith. Anyone who has ever been saved has only been saved, whether in Genesis or in the book of Revelation, has only been saved through faith in the, in the promised mercy of God. We see that in the life of Abraham. He is probably the clearest example of it. Romans chapter 4 you can turn there with me if you would like to. Romans chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, Paul says, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Why was Abraham counted righteous? Because of his faith, because he believed in the mercy of God. And some might argue, well, Abraham didn't have adequate revelation to believe in the promised Messiah. Well, I don't think that's totally true. I think from Genesis 3, there's been adequate revelation to believe in the promised Messiah. And one of the reasons I believe that is because Jesus himself says, Abraham saw me. In John chapter 8, Jesus says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. How did Abraham see the day of Jesus? Oh, he wasn't alive at the coming of Jesus. He wasn't on the earth. How did Abraham see the day of Jesus? He saw it through the eyes of faith in the promises of God. He didn't know who Jesus would be. He didn't know exactly what Jesus would do. He didn't know when Jesus would come. But he knew that there was promised mercy through the Messiah. He saw the day of Jesus through the eyes of faith, and he rejoiced and was glad when he did. So Moses was saved by faith. Anyone who has ever been saved is saved by faith on the basis of Christ's redeeming work in the new covenant. The covenant of grace, then, is the only grounds of salvation ever. No one is ever saved at any point in the Bible by any means other than the covenant of grace. But what about, we'll end with this, what about the Mosaic covenant? 
What about the covenant made with Moses? How does that covenant fit into this understanding of the covenant of grace? Because if you're familiar with the covenant of Moses, then it seems like a covenant of works, doesn't it? Couldn't someone argue that the covenant with Moses was a covenant of works because in it, God promised blessing upon obedience and curses upon disobedience. Doesn't that make it a covenant of works? Well, in some ways, yes, it does. In some ways, the covenant of Moses, the, the, the covenant made with Moses in the law, is a covenant of works. The people were promised that if they obey, they will experience God's blessing. And the people were promised that if they disobey, they will be punished by God. It was a covenant of works. But in another sense, it wasn't a covenant of works. Let me try to explain that. The covenant with Moses was a covenant made with the nation of Israel. The purpose of the covenant was to tell the nation of Israel how they should live as God's redeemed people. God did not give the law and then redeem his people based on the law. God redeemed his people out of Egypt, and then he gave them the law. And then he said, this law is the covenant by which you ought to walk. Here are the, the requirements for you to live as my people with regard to your government, with regard to your ethics, your morals, and with regard to your worship. Here is how you must live. And as a nation, if Israel obeyed God's commands, then they would experience God's blessing in the promised land. And as a nation, if, if Israel disobeyed God's commands, then they would experience God's curse with regard to the promised land. And they would be exiled and scattered among the nations. It was a covenant of works. The health of Israel depended on their obedience. But a nation's blessing under the covenant of Moses in the promised land is not the same thing as eternal salvation. Eternal life could never come through the law, whether it's the Mosaic covenant or any other covenant. And God was not promising in the Mosaic covenant that anyone would ever have eternal life based on their obedience. That wasn't the purpose of the law. It was never intended to be a means of us trying to gain eternal life. The purpose of the law is not to promise, obedience, promise eternal life based on obedience. The purpose of the law is to point us to Christ. It is a school teacher. It is a tutor that directs our attention to Jesus. Galatians 3, verses 21 to 22. This is what the Apostle Paul writes concerning the covenant with Moses and the law. He says, is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Is God promising life based on obedience rather than by his grace? Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. But the scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Even when the nation of Israel was under the Mosaic law, they were not supposed to try to earn eternal life through that law. It was never for that purpose. But that's what many of them ended up doing. Many of them started to use the law then of Moses, the covenant with Moses, as a legalistic attempt to gain life. And that's why they saw no need for the Messiah when he came. But what Paul is saying is that a right understanding of the covenant made with Moses does not lead us to try to gain life through obedience, or it didn't lead them at that time. It shouldn't have led them to try to gain life through obedience. The covenant of Moses is intended to lead us to the promises of God in Christ through faith. Yes, the covenant of Moses certainly exposes our sin, but the covenant of Moses also reveals God's provision in the sacrifices. The covenant of law crushes you because you can't keep it. But the covenant of law also promises life through faith in the promised mercy of God, pictured in the sacrifices. 
And so when we get to the book of Hebrews then and we start to see the outworking of how all of those laws and all of those ceremonies and the priests and the sacrifices and how all of those things point us to Christ, they're a shadow of the good things that would come through Christ, we're reminded God has always dealt graciously with his people. From the very beginning, he has always promised, you will be saved by faith in my, in, in my Savior that I will send. He will accomplish the salvation by which you will be redeemed. And every covenant promise he made, from Abraham to the promises of the new covenant and the prophets, always points to that grace. A, if, if we see something other than that, if we see in any of the covenants that God is promising eternal life based on works rather than on the mercy of his son, then we have twisted and distorted God's covenants and his revelation. Every covenant is intended to lead us to the mercy that would be revealed in Jesus. All right. That's it for this chapter then on God's covenants. From the beginning, God has been revealing his covenant of grace through Christ that has reached its fullest revelation now in the arrival of Christ. I don't think there are many doctrines in the Bible that are more encouraging than the doctrine of the covenants. If you think about it, God has put himself under obligation to fulfill his promise of grace to you. He has put himself under his own oath. He has sworn by himself that he will accomplish salvation based on grace. What that means then is that it's not our ability that will bring about salvation in any way. It is God's ability and God's determination to do what he has promised to do. So we'll finish the short quote from Michael Barrett. He says, I pray that this covenant concept will sink into our souls. It truly boggles the mind that the God who owes nothing to anyone obligates himself to fulfill all the terms of the covenant and make good on every promise. The gospel of Christ is no maybe gospel. It must work or God is not God. We'll sing in just a moment in the solid rock. If I have the lyrics somewhere. His oath, his covenant, and his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. In a world that is wrecked by sin, God's covenant is a firm foundation in the storm. Let's pray. Our Father, we do thank you for your grace toward us through the Lord Jesus Christ. God, we would not even be able to lift our face to you with any degree of confidence. We would never be able to address you as our Father. We would never be able to call you our own. We would never be on good terms with you if it were not for your mercy and through the forgiveness which you have accomplished through the blood of Jesus. We thank you, God, for your wisdom as it's revealed in the scripture, showing us the way that you would accomplish your salvation. We pray that you would continue to help us to grow in our understanding of your word. Help us to see the beauty of your wisdom revealed on every page as we see Christ and his redeeming work pictured there for us and promised and prefigured in all that we read. God, we pray that you would give, our, give us, give our hearts a deep confidence and gratitude for the covenant of grace that you've made with us through Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen.